a group of children in unison giving a straight arm salute. You might look at this image and feel pretty uncomfortable. What if I told you that this is actually a classroom of American children in the United States reciting the Pledge of Allegiance? A little scary. You might be horrified to see this. You might wonder how we as a society have allowed things to get this far. Well, these are in fact real photos, only they were taken 80 years ago. <laughs> they were taken before Hitler and the Nazi party were inspired by the salute and used it for its own purposes. America is pretty much forgotten but from the very first time the Pledge of Allegiance was recited in 1892, this was the only salute in classrooms across the country. It wasn't until 1942 that it was replaced by the hand over the heart that we're all familiar with today. It's so easy to jump to conclusions and assume that one frame of knowledge is the only right frame of knowledge. For all the talents and all the skills and all the creativity that we've shown as a species, we've never been very good at figuring out if someone is lying to us. And that's true even when someone has the same values, beliefs, and the same language as you do. But what if that someone that you're talking to has spent their most formative years in a place where the most basic aspects of communicating with each other was drastically different than what you're used to. What happens next? When we don't fully understand the cultural context in which something is said, we're likely to make very huge mistakes in understanding someone's intentions. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Before I really understood culture, I was on a British Airways flight. And it was about dinner time, and the flight attendant came up to me and said, good evening, Mr. Friedman, we're glad to have you on board. We've accidentally loaded the breakfast meals on the airplane. If you're okay with breakfast, then we have a selection you can choose from. But if you really want your dinner and you're entitled to it, we can arrange to delay the flight a little bit and make sure we have an opportunity to bring your dinner on board. Well, I have to tell you, for 20 years, I was probably telling everybody I met, I can't believe British Airways. That's unbelievable customer service. They're willing to delay the flight to give me my meal? Well, I'm here to tell you now, I understand British culture much better. That wasn't their intent. No. The hint that I should have had was, remember how I said a moment ago, I can't believe they would do that for me? Well, one of the best hints about understanding cultures good or bad, is when your reaction is, I can't believe they would do that for me, there might be something you might be missing. And in this case, it was avoiding confrontation and a British understatement. And to avoid confrontation, a separation of words and thought, or coded speech. See, even though we speak the same language, we don't really interpret each other exactly the same. So when you hear someone British say, I think I've seen better, you know what they're really saying? <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> and what's particularly confusing is that when they say, I've seen worse, what they really mean is, it was good. <laughs> These things may seem fairly innocuous, but in a business situation, imagine when you've made the best possible deal you can, and you hear, hmm, interesting idea. What they might really be telling you is we're not interested. <laughs> and the British are not the only ones who have a separation between word and thought. You can find this in many different cultures. Okay. Let's talk about Japan. Some of you might be aware of this. When the Japanese say we agree, what do they mean? We don't agree. <laughs> There's not a very close relationship. 
between word and thought. I know plenty of business people who go to Japan and hear, that may be difficult, and come home and tell their boss, well, at least he didn't say no. <laughs> he did say no, you just didn't pick up on it. You didn't pick up on the, it's going to be difficult. And there's also that utterance, the slight tilt of the head, the sucking in of air, the that's a signal that whatever follows next is no. <laughs> I'm in Japan. I'm in a large Western hotel with a restaurant. And I order my lunch with a cup of tea. And the waitress brings me my cup of tea and my lunch. And I say, may I have some sweetener for my tea? And she says, oh, I'm so sorry. We don't have any sweetener. You're a huge hotel. You deal with Westerners all the time. This whole hotel, you have no sweetener? Oh, sweetener. Oh, you want sweetener? Oh, no, sorry. We, we don't have any sweetener. I said, okay, fine, fine, fine. Just bring me a cup of coffee. She takes back the tea. She brings me the coffee out with an entire caddy of sweeteners. <laughs> For the life of me, I can't understand what happened. And then what you find out is that nobody in Japan put sweetener in their green tea. It's just not done. And if I had done that, I could have embarrassed myself. I could have embarrassed myself in front of everybody in the same restaurant. The waitress didn't want to put me in that position. So it was easier for her, if you will, to lie to me about whether they had sweetener or not. She knew what I was saying, but she wanted me to save face. But it goes to show you how in other cultures there are much greater priorities than there are in the US. So codes in Japanese culture are harmony. And many times if they are unable to meet a request, that may be avoiding confrontation. Then again, I can't believe with the sweetener. So let's look at the opposite side of that spectrum, a country that's blunt and factual. And I'm gonna use as an example, a client of mine from Finland. He was an expat living in the US, and my initial engagement was to shadow him and see him out in front of customers. And in one meeting when he was asked whether he can deliver to their schedule and to their requirements a particular design, my client said, well, we have a small team, we have limited resources, and your schedule is very tight. So I don't really see there being a very good opportunity for us to do that, but I'm willing to take it back to my management and see what they say. And Yuka, my Finnish client, says to me when we walk out of the room, I think that meeting went really well. I think we're going to get that deal. <laughs> I said, Yuka, not in the US. We don't build credibility by giving a worst case scenario <laughs> and then trying to explain it better. So in some cultures, it's more important to deliver that brutal honesty and those facts. And again, the reaction is, I can't believe you're telling me that. Now imagine for a second, a guy like Yuka going to a country where there's a very wide separation between word and deed. And imagine how lost he would get dealing with the people in that culture. In Germany, also quite the contrast to Japan. When they say we don't agree, and Germans have a very tight word-thought correlation, what they mean is, we don't agree. <laughs> I find Israel fascinating, because in Israel, if you've heard them say, impossible, you know what they're really telling you? We think you can do a lot better than that. That's just your opening bid, and we realize that, but we're challenging you to come back with something stronger. Now, the U.S. likes to inject a little bit of cynicism. And in doing so, when we have not been convinced, we'll say, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and it's amazing, actually, how many times we say this. So what is truth? Well, it really depends on context. And it's the examples we just showed, how words and thoughts are used in that country. You have to look at how important harmony is to that culture and whether it manifests itself in saving face and what they will and won't say in different situations. 
You have to also look at the priority a culture puts on diplomacy versus the absolute truth and facts. But at the most basic level, everybody on the planet shares common ways of behaving if it has to do with survival. And the next level up is social culture groups that we belong to or that we have been influenced by from regional, national influence, our religion, our education, and all our experiences. And then finally, individual personality characteristics because whether you lie or tell the truth, culture is how you should behave. Personality is actually how you want to behave. And I was on a flight a few months back and somebody said, you don't have to tell me about culture. I know the golden rule. That tells me that person believes in something that first came about when people only traveled 30 miles in their entire lifetime and never got exposed to somebody else's culture. And that's why there should be a rule about treating others the way they want to be treated. Now, there's been a book written called The Platinum Rule, but I don't like the term platinum. Because look at the physical characteristics of platinum. It carries a certain amount of prestige. It's a rare element. It's not sensitive to the environment. And it's a catalyst for combustion. So I'm not sure that's the right term I want to use for the next rule. Okay, I'm from Silicon Valley. Nonetheless, I still think silicon has some attributes that make sense. For example, it has excellent bonding properties. <laughs> it's great at developing relationships with other elements. You can actually grow it with the right process. And finally, it withstands intense heat and activity without breaking down. So if there was ever an element that I think should represent that context matters, I think it's silicon. <laughs> As I said, context really is everything. And I want to show you just how important context is. These two gentlemen standing here, one is orange, one is green, right? Or are they? Where's the context of this situation? Distorting your perspective. Because in fact, these are exactly the same. <laughs> context can totally affect your perception of reality. So we all know that our lives are becoming more intercultural. Study after study has shown that multicultural teams get better results than homogenous teams. So what we need to really do is get a better understanding of each other. Because when we seek out the traits we share and embrace our differences, we'll have not only achieved more, but we'll have transcended those differences. Thank you very much.